Thank you. Hey, Meg. Hey. Oh, look at you all nice people. Hi. Hi. What a treat. Did you FedEx people that were out of town? Yeah, you? I did. <laughs> yes. All right, I'm going to say this and then I'm sadly going to hop away. I said it to the people who are here and I couldn't say who I could see. It's really cool to be part of this meeting to get cookies and I wish I could hear all the stories, but I have to go to a work meeting because my saved half hour didn't get saved. <laughs> so I'm now two minutes late to my work meeting, but I wanted to say hello, especially I hadn't seen some of you in a long time. So I just been... realized that I forgot my mug. I have to go get my mug. <laughs> cheers, <laughs> cheers and thank you, Lisa. Appreciate yep. you made bye it. Bye-bye. Bye. Have fun. Nothing like having your host disappear. <laughs> Dana, hi, Dana. Hi. How are you? Good, nice to see you. Like good to be seen by someone. <laughs> yeah. All right, shall we begin? Should we wait a few more minutes? Your call. Uh, I think we have a quorum. Do we have a quorum? <laughs> or a minion. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> Great, all right, so let's begin. Welcome, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Um, this is our first ever Cookies and Milk with Friends. So you're all um, part of an experiment and uh, we hope that you learn something about us and we're gonna learn a little bit about you. I'm gonna learn a lot about how we do a Zoom meeting and um, have a conversation, both the technical side, which is being masterfully handed handled by Leslie Levy. Um, so we're all gonna we're all gonna learn something today. So thank you for coming. Um, I love uh, being connected to Friends of the Children. Uh, I, I am lucky to call myself a founding board member of the Chicago chapter, which means that I get to work with Tal um, and uh, get a glimpse of the kind of work that Melanie Adams does as one of our friends. You're gonna hear more about that later, but um, I really think it's a wonderful organization and I love being connected in even a distant way to um, what's going on in the Austin and North Lawndale communities here in Chicago. Um, it's also good to be part of a huge national organization. There are chapters all over the country, so it feels uh, like a community and I'm really proud of you to be part of this community and I'm really happy that you're here today too. Um, a few housekeeping notes. We are recording this call, so whatever you say can and will be used against you, um, so we can learn from it. Um, we're going to be doing a few polls at the start, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tal and Melanie, who are going to have a conversation. If at any moment during the day you have a question, you can write it in the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, I think we also have a raise hand function. Do you have a raise hand function? No, so if you if at some point you want to voice your question instead of putting it in the chat, just raise your hand and um, tell or talking. Melanie yeah. or somebody will call on you. This is this is a conversation, not a presentation. Um, so let's start. I think we have four polls. So Leslie, if you would mind putting up the first poll. Working on it. Great. <laughs> Uh, gosh, this is a poll, not a test, right? <laughs> right, right. No wrong answer. Uh, Do we have? Yeah, a I don't think the poll is working. It says, <laughs> I think because Tal and I are sharing the same logon. Um, Tal, can you click on the poll link at the bottom of the screen and see if it comes up for you? Yes, it does. Oh, wait, share, relaunch. Yeah. So they kicked us out because we were um, sharing the same log on okay. to rat those folks. I'd be happy to read them for you. Or, or um, I can now see the poll. I can see it. Right. Yeah. Great. So how did you hear about friends? So you get to respond to the poll. And then we eat a cookie? 
and then you can do cookies. <laughs> One cookie per, per question. Okay, that's great. That's so helpful. Thank you. And then I, can we have question number two? Let's see. How to move it. Oh, I think that it's timed. At the top of the poll, do you see a uh, drop down menu that you can flip? I don't know, but it's a question two. Oh, we got the answer. The results. Now we've now well, we're sharing the results. Yeah. Okay. If we can switch to the next one very quickly, we're going to stop. I don't know why. Okay. Sorry about this, folks. I don't know how to do the next one. But the one polling question. Oh, no. Mm, I don't part. have a thing to switch to the next one. End polling. No way. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Now it just showed up. Can you guys see that? No, not yet. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hmm. How familiar are you with friends of the children? We love our newbies and kindas. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Oh, here we go. I'm a master at this now. <laughs> um, did you have a mentor who helped you grow? Someone in your life who supported you and made you be the awesome person who you are today? Formal, informal, doesn't matter. Some of us did and some of us didn't. And our final question, which is really the heart of the whole thing. Is it cookies and milk or milk and cookies? <laughs> I bet this is geographical. <clears throat> Very, uh, Jeannie and I had a knockdown wrestle and she pinned me to the ground. And, and you win, Tal, according to this poll. <laughs> but it's pretty darn close. Um, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for helping us with that. Um, and now, at this moment, I'm going to turn the whole shebang over to our executive director, Tal hazak -Lowy and one of our superstar friends, Melanie Adams. So, hi, everyone. Um, I am so, so grateful that you all are here. Uh, it's very, very fun to see familiar faces or familiar names or just anyone associated with Genies always already, someone that I adore. Um, and the way this came about is, you know, I, our friends are the ones doing the real work. Um, and I have to check in with the friends every once in a while and I try to get a story from them and then send it out in an email to you all to try to capture the work of our friends and really humanize our families and the kids that we work with so that people understand what's going on. And, you know, I'm an okay storyteller in that um, we have such compelling stories that we're working with, but I always just wish that I could have more people just hear directly from the friends. Um, and Jeannie, who is such a phenomenal founding board member, but also stepped up at the beginning of the pandemic to decide to chair our development committee. Um, I get to speak with her several times a week right now. So first of all, that's just a delight in and of itself, because all of you know that. Um, but she gets to hear a bunch more stories because right before we'll talk, I'll tell her I just spoke with a friend and I heard a story. And we just tried to think about, like, how do we get these stories out? You know, I wish I could meet with, you know, with people over coffee and tell them the stories. And Jeannie had the much better idea that milk and cookies are much better than just coffee. And so cheers to Jeannie. Thank you for the mugs and the delicious cookies that I ate during rehearsal before. Um, and, um, and for all of you just for sitting here to be in conversation with us. Um, so Melanie has been with us for, a year and a half, coming up on two years. 
um, is really a superstar friend. Um, and she and I spoke today, yesterday just sort of in preparation for today. And I'm just really excited for what you all are gonna to get to hear. So Melanie, just sort of just to start also, just for, take us back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, those first two months. And if you can just share with everyone sort of what type of support you were providing our families, like how did things change for our families then? Yeah, um, I would say initially we just went into like crisis support mode because a lot of people were losing jobs. They were, the children were told they couldn't go to school uh, right away. And so that shift initially from being in class to at home, that first experience with e-learning was complete chaos. And a lot of students didn't have internet. A lot of students didn't have devices. Um, so immediately we were starting to try to figure out who needs internet access, who needs devices, how can we supply that to you? Um, who needs a quick tutorial on how to use these devices? I, a lot of my children live with their grandparents and a lot of, sorry to any grandparents out there, but a lot of grandparents aren't the most tech savvy people. So um, that was a, a big barrier for us. And then just, just simple things like food. Um, during, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were also dealing with a lot of social injustice in our country. So there was a lot of looting and protests going on. So some of our families couldn't even go to the grocery store and get food. And um, that was because the grocery stores were closed or closing early. And, um, and so just stepping in in that way was like our first initial response at the beginning of the pandemic. And, um... And e-learning has been going a little bit better right now, but can you talk about some of the challenges that some of the kids are having about e, like through e-learning right now? Um, right now, it is a lot better than it was before, but um, it's just not the same as being in the classroom. I think that's the, the biggest um, difference is that they, they're forced to do a lot of independent things. And a lot of our children, they're in our program because they needed extra help in the first place. So expecting expecting a, a first or second grader or now second and third grader to work independently um, is really, especially when there's not much support um, from adults at home is, is really tough on our kids. So uh, right now that's the most prevalent struggle is just having um, someone to keep them aligned and you know not falling behind. If the rest of the class is on number four, you know, I still have students who are doodling or turn their camera off and go do whatever. And there's really nothing or no one to really hold them accountable. So now I wanna sort of shift us to talk about more specific stories about some of the kids. Um, and I think that, you know, people think of us as mentors and we do a lot of work with the kids, but you actually work really closely with caregivers as well. Um, and so, First, I'd like for you to share the story of um, Faith and some of the issues that her grandmother is having and sort of what Faith has been experiencing, but how you've been supporting grandma through this. Yeah, um, so Faith- It would happen last week. Yeah. Okay, um, so Faith, she uh, has a lot of um, emotional abandonment issues, some just behavioral things that have been ongoing in her life um, since I've known her. And uh, with her current situation, it's just, she's not adjusting well to all of the changes that are happening. And most of the time when people are under stress, they digress. And so we're seeing her do things like um, not sleep in her own bedroom. She doesn't, she actually, her grandmother had to move her bed into the hallway because she did not wanna be out of her grandmother's sight. Like she was really starting to have this clinging um, tendency and, and grandma, you know, has stepped up and takes care of a lot of children. Um, How many in the kids home. are in the house, Melanie? I'm How sorry. Many, How many kids are in the house? I think seven, and three of which are her children, who are um, middle school aged, and then she has two older children who are adult age. One being Faith's mother, who isn't in the home, but she comes there pretty often. Sometimes, if she needs to drop off her younger kids you know, they stay with grandma while she's out and about. So, um, so this is just a lot of, um, just a lot of people and a lot of things going on in the house in general. And so um, um, Faith has been kind of acting out as a, 
result of all of the stress and the trauma that's happening in her life. So she, um, grandma had really wanted to send her to a behavioral specialist institution called Hartgrove Hospital. And she was prepared to just send her off and just say, I can't deal with this. Um, we need intervention like ASAP. And, and she was going to admit her for inpatient services. However, um, her, t her teacher, Ms. Pierre, was able to really talk with her and explain to her the traumatic response that that would then cause even further. So after us, us all collaborating together and talking, she decided to do outpatient services. So now Faith keeps going. Um, she just started last week, but she um, she's so far it's been good for her because she needs that consistency because learning at home just isn't the best for her. Um, so I think her grandmother, you know, having that relationship with me and with other supportive adults has really helped to give her um, just that that pat on the back, like you're doing the best that you can and I'm gonna have your back regardless and we're gonna do what's best for this child together. And understanding, I think just having a, a person who's there for your child, but who also cares about your well-being as well and is there to tell you like to just be your cheerleader because we know that that's a lot of that stuff like to be a parent to be a grandparent like that's a job that never ends and and I understand that so just being able to have another person who's able to validate those feelings I think um our parents find that really really supportive and you said something really interesting to me yesterday when we were talking about your work with parents and you compared it to when you were working in the foster care system and why you have a better relationship with parents now. Can you just share that with everyone? Yeah, I would say from my background in foster care, I, I used to always, um, well, one, we used to teach our parents that um, to expect to go through this, this trauma with this child and not experience it is, is almost like thinking you could walk through water without getting wet. You're gonna have some, some vicarious trauma just from being attached to this child. And I think that as a mentor, understanding that I'm your child's mentor, like I'm there to ride or die for your child, but it comes, you kind of get a package deal because I love you too. You know, I'm gonna be there for, for your sister, your brother, like some, I have some kids who it's sometimes it's like a group thing and they're all like, Miss Melanie's here. And even though I am the one kid's mentor, they all look to me as that trusted individual. And I have my one-on-one -on -one time with my kid, but for that kid to see that the whole entire family responds well to me, it just builds that trust and makes that relationship a lot more solidified. Thanks. Um, many of the families that we deal with, deal with uh, experience trauma greatly and since the pandemic sort of far and above just just the pandemic mm -hmm. um uh joy is one of your girls that's really been through a ton um this last few months if you can share a little bit about what's happened in her family mm -hmm. how you supported her through the initial crisis and what you're doing with her in school right now yes um so joy that's my baby that's that's mm -hmm. my heart right there she um she's been through a lot um, just in her short seven years of life. And um, over the summer, she lost her mom. And for me, that was, it was really, really tough just to be strong and then also try to be understanding that we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I had to have a long conversation with, with my supervisor, with Seth, because I'm like, Seth, I have to be there. Like I'm going over there and I'm gonna sit in their house and I'm going to go to the funeral. I'm going to be at the repast. I'm going to be serving food because that's I love them. And and that and that's a loss that very few people have to experience. And to experience that so young, it was it was a lot. And to be able to still push through and persevere and the amount of strength and courage that I see in her. Sorry, y'all. Let me. <laughs> it's like it just gives me so much hope to see somebody so small be so strong is so incredible. So right now she um, she was one of the kids who were who was struggling a lot academically before the pandemic. And um, to, to my surprise, she actually has been doing really great 
with the e-learning. Like I think just having that um, ability to sit down and have her parent with her, her grandma at the house and honing in on her, um, on her just ability to listen because she can get off task easily and just being able to focus. We were actually trying to get her an IEP before the pandemic, but um, things, you know, school shut down. So that, that didn't happen. But now she's improved so much that me and her grandmother, we, we're not sure if she needs an IEP anymore and that it wasn't a, an issue of her not being able to learn. It was just the, the just all the, the distractions and things that were happening in the school or in the classroom with all the different moves and the things that were happening in her life. So um, now she, we started to implement like a marble re reward system and she responds so good to that. Like she, I have three girls who use the marble jars and she is the only one who is about to get a reward this week because she literally like, she will read something and then like, do I get a marble now? <laughs> and she was the same kid who, who we couldn't sit, get to sit down and read three sentences. And now she like, she pushes for it and it's, it's awesome because she's like, I already know what I want. I only got one marble left and she's just so excited about it. So, um, and it was actually kind of funny because she and I were sitting out in the living room doing her, her reading and her older sister was in the bedroom. And then once we finished and she earned her marbles and we finished counting the marbles that she earned for the day, her sister comes out the room and she's like, oh, okay, so you can read. And then she was like, what? And she was like, I was like, so cool. Uh, so Joy, you um you act like you don't know how to read, and her sister's like, yeah. When you're not here, she's like, I don't know how to do this. She just you know does not focus. And I was like, Joy, there is nothing cute about being playing dumb. So don't don't do that. If you know the answer to something, like be proud, stand up, and and say I know the answer. And then she's like, uh, I don't know what y'all talking about. And then like walks <laughs> out the room, and I'm like, oh my goodness. So she she's just. So she just so joy, like she just, she's just full of it. So I, I love her. Um, so one thing I didn't say at the beginning, so each of our friends works with eight kids and spends four hours a week individually with each kid um, and meeting their individual needs. And so Melanie, I was wondering if you could just share a little bit, like how do you go about planning an outing? How do you decide what you're going to do with your girls when you see them? Um, yeah, so like Paul said, we each have eight kids that are all at different levels who enjoy different things. So there's no cookie cutter way to meet each child or, or do something with each child. So for me, it just comes based off of my interaction with those with that particular child. So if I have a kid who's um, really independent or really into um, like math or something, I'll try to plan an outing or a visit that is, that's going to engage them, that's going to challenge them. And then I know that they're going to um, actually enjoy. So I don't want to do the same thing with every single kid. I want to do what what's actually going to be fruitful for this child. So um, like, for example, I have one kid who was very, um, she's really on track with her learning. And so I don't really have to spend a lot of time with her um, doing homework or completing um, like school assignments. But she really likes um, playing this game called Roblox. And so we were playing Roblox one, one um, afternoon. Video game. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a video game where you can go on and, and play. It's like games within a game. So like Atari for people who know who Atari is. So if you go into Roblox and you pick a different game, we picked a game that was like a marble racing game. And you would just, you know, select the marble and then let it go. And you're like watching it race. And so I'm talking to her and I'm like, so how would you like to do this like in real life? And she's like, what, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, we can make a, a marble track like together. And she was like, for real? So I was like, yeah. So then we, for like two weeks, it was all about scheduling to make that happen. So after we played the next week, I went over and we made a list. We talked about it. We talked about STEM. We talked about what materials we need to get, what she would get, what I would get, because there was things like, well, you can get the toilet paper rolls. So you're responsible for collecting all the toilet paper rolls in your house and when I come back next week, so she knew what she was responsible for. I knew what I was going to go to the store and buy. And then so the third week when I came back, you know, I had all the material and then we sat down and we, we did it together. So it, it was it was actually really fun and it was cool to see her problem solve. So like if at one point we drop the marble and it gets stuck on one of the racetracks, I'm like, OK, so how do you think we can adjust this so that it makes it to the next level? So we'll tweak it a little bit or she'll add different um little like pom-poms or different barriers 
and um and just you know just making it her own and just talking about different things and I'm like um making the bridges and doing all those things that that require you know science technology engineering and math and she was was really into it and I'm like you're gonna build a bridge one day like you're gonna be like you're you're figuring these things out so um so yeah so that that's Ashley and she's she's one of my girls who I can do more um, fun things with because she she really um, thrives off that type of engagement. Uh, Dana asked a, a great question to ask if you're a social worker. And I was like, you actually are trained to be a social worker, yeah. but most of the friends are not. And so it's, you know, it's some, so funny when I got recruited to launch the Chicago office, I was like, friends of the children almost sounds like a pretty creepy name. Like it's, <laughs> I, 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 the one thing I would want to change about, the only thing I'd want to change about this program is really rebrand the name. Um, maybe like auntie and uncles of the program could be <laughs> better, but it's, um, our friends aren't social workers. Our friends that need, we identify when our kids have needs, like we have some of our kids that really need the help of a therapist and then we make sure that they get to therapy. Um, what we are is we're non-official relatives that are serving in that, um, a loving, consistent, positive role in their lives. Um, and so just as a parent, when I, when my daughter's really sad, I'm not a therapist, but I'm just there to listen to her and let her express her feelings. And if it feels out of my, what I can do for her, then I'm going to get her to see a therapist. That's the same thing that our friends do. What they're, th what they're there to do is really identify issues and to be a consistent presence. It actually comes in, um, I'm thinking about, uh, hold on, we have code names for all the girls. I'm thinking about what you recently told me about Danielle. Um, and about love and sort of the way, we know that Danielle's mom loves her a lot, but can you just talk about the difference and so sort of the role that you're playing in her life? Um, and yeah, if you can just explain yeah. that. Um, yeah, so Danielle is like my little hard knocker. Like she, like she's, <laughs> she's the best. Like she's, she's really cool, but she's she's rough around the edges so she's and and that's just how she's she's raised that's how her mom is that's how her siblings are like they play fight they they jones with one another which is like when you talk about each other but it's in a playful loving way like like your mama this or your daddy this like they they joke like that around the house and um well we were every year um when our kids get to the third grade they're able to take an assessment for the youth because it's important for us to know, want to know and hear from our youth their opinion and their thoughts on the program and how their mentors are doing because youth voice and youth participation is really important um, in any youth serving program, in my opinion. And I feel like having um, them say something or actually be asked, how do you feel about something is very important. So when we sat down and did all of our assessments with our third graders, um, when I got my assessment back for, and also we don't do the assessments on our own kids because we don't want them to feel pressured or feeling sort of biased because if your mentor sucks, you need to feel safe enough to say my mentor sucks. So um, <laughs> another mentor would, would carry out those assessments. So when I got my assessment back from for Danielle and I was reading it, one of my colleagues, he put a little star and wanted to talk to me about one of the responses that she shared. And it was about um, feeling loved and she, her response was, um, well, kind of, like, I know my mom loves me, but I don't really feel love from home, but I do feel love from my mentor. Like, I know Miss Melanie loves me. And for me, it was like, um, it was, it was encouraging, but it was also a little disheartening because I know her mom and she and I have a good relationship, but like, even in the same breath, like, I'll be at the house and her mom will say something to her and then she'll come back with like, well, you're fat. And then her mom will be like, well, you bald head. And then I'm just sitting there like, okay, <laughs> because that's how they talk to each other. But, you know, who am I to, to, to judge or say anything about that? Um, I'm just a big softy. Like I, I cuddle and talk sweet to my cat. So I, of course I'm going to do that with um, all of my girls. So just knowing that she's able to identify and receive love in different ways. But the fact that she knows that she has this mentor and that the people a part of this organization do love and care about her, it does mean a lot to me because that means that I'm doing something right because she trusts me 
and she loves me and I love her back and her family and I have a good relationship. And, um, and, and that's really what it's, what it's all about. Just fostering those strong relationships. And, um, right. Just being that strong, positive, consistent relationship for our kids. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, our kids across the board have parents and caregivers that adore them. Um, and I, many of our parents and caregivers are dealing with such trauma, are so scared that something bad's going to happen to their kids, that sometimes the love gets buried under their worries for their kids or their sort of defense factors. And so that's who the friends are in their kids' lives. Um, I want to honor our time of half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if anyone has to go after half an hour, please, please go. We're so, so appreciative because I would, I want to sit here and talk to you for like three hours because I have so many things I want you guys to learn about Friends of the Children. Um, Melanie is brilliant in the work that she does with her kids. Um, so I want to invite anyone that has questions to ask questions and anyone that has to go. Thank you so, so much from the bottom of our hearts for sharing part of your afternoon with us. Um, yeah. Ooh, Marble League. Yeah, yeah, right. Bob, that's cool. <laughs> I'm just looking at the chat. Yeah, and you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions out loud too. Uh, Maggie had a question about how mentors are trained, Tal. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Maggie. So um, all of our friends have to have at least a bachelor's degree in two years experience working with vulnerable youth. Um, the kids that we work with, we intentionally work to identify and serve the kids facing the greatest risk factors. And so we start working with kids in kindergarten. So we wanna work, we work with kids that have already experienced significant trauma by the time they're five. Um, and so this isn't a job for a newbie or someone that just likes hanging out with kids. Um, once a friend starts, they have one month full-time training with us before they set foot or work with any children. Um, they all also go to Portland to our national office to receive one week training there. And then the next month they spend shadowing another friend to learn how our model works. Um, a bunch of the initial training is training them about uh, adverse childhood experiences. Um, teaching them what happens when, what happens to just a human being's brain when they experience trauma and what happens to a youth when, they when, when they're exposed to that. Um, and then we go through all the different core assets, the, the, um, the skills that we're working to teach our kids and how we go about doing that. Anything else, Melanie, that you would add about the training when you started? Um, that's pretty much the most of it. I would say um, for me, a lot of it was from just previous experience and then when I came into friends um it was just all hands on deck let's all it was very collaborative we did a lot of group reading I felt like I was back in grad school the way that we would like read different chapters of books and then come together and just like talk about it and I really appreciated that style because um I, I thrive under that type of leadership and I think that it helped to build our morale and our our team just like all of us are like we're like a real team like we we really all like figure out like where our strengths lie and how we can help build one another so um yeah and then i did you mention the portland training the national training yeah, yeah. and then it was all it's really cool to be able to go to the um national you know portland site and then meet people from different chapters and how they operate and run their chapters and just kind of just pulling from everyone's knowledge and um skill set to go yeah. Um, so how family, we've had 11 families, 11 of our, we have uh, 63 kids in the program right now, 11 of our families that we know have had someone, at least one person in their home that's had COVID. Um, a big struggle, thank God, no one, everyone has, uh, everyone has made, of our families has made it through the COVID. Uh, we've had two of our kids got COVID themselves. Um, when the parents got sick with several of the families, not only do we have to help them with their health care to figure out how to get testing and what to do if they knew they were exposed, but to figure out safe child care while they were sick. And so we worked really closely with our families and delivered food with those families as well. Um, and we have, I would say that the, before the pandemic, approximately, and I'm sorry I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but approximately 
two thirds of our families were working or had adults in the house that were working and one third weren't working. And about half of the two thirds that were working lost their jobs during the pandemic. Most of them worked in the hospitality industry. Um, the other ones were still considered um, essential workers. So we had people affected those two different ways uh, through COVID. How do we identify kids? Um, so in Chicago for the first two years, the way we identify kids is we partner with Chicago Public Schools um, and we go into kindergarten classes for two weeks and we're looking for kids that meet our criteria. So we're looking for the kids with the greatest risk factors and the least protective factors in their lives. So we're looking for the kids that don't come to school regularly, that are falling asleep at their desks, there, Seth, our program director, jokes that he knows who our kids are, or at least some of them are, because that's who, their names on the chalkboard because they're getting in trouble in the classroom. Um, if we go into a kindergarten class, which has happened several times, and there's a kid at a desk facing the back of the room, that's usually going to be one of our kids. Um, once we see which of the kids seem the most disengaged in the classroom, we talk to the teachers, the social workers, and the principals to find out what type of support they're getting at home because just to, because a kid is getting into trouble in school doesn't mean that they don't have a strong supportive network at home. So we're looking for the kids who the school is really exacerbated with because no one's coming to the schools when they want a parent teacher conference or they have frustrations with the child or they're not coming in for IEP meetings. Those are our kids. Um, one of the frustrations with that sometimes is that teachers are human beings and we all have biases and they tend to be biased against our kids because they're a pain in the butt and they really want to help kids on the cusp. And so we really try to work with them to make them sure that they, I, that they grow to understand, and now our partner schools have, grow to understand that we're really looking for the kid the society wants to give up on in kindergarten because we believe those kids all have great potential as well. Um, just one thing that I was just going to add on to that for a sec is that many of our parents and caregivers because of living in poverty and the trauma that they've experienced during their lives, don't trust systems, think that teachers and principals hate them, judge them because of how their kids are doing. And so they don't feel safe or trusting to come to a parent teacher conferences. And actually Melanie, I, we won't have time, but Melanie, um, Melanie has an incredible example about a mom who wants to fiercely advocate for her daughter. Um, a mom who was getting so frustrated at the school that they weren't meeting the needs of her daughter that she threatened to physically harm them because she was so angry. But it came from a place of love that she just wanted them to take care of their girls. But because Melanie had a strong relationship with the school and mom, she was able to bring people together um, and get them to work together. Melanie, do you want to add anything just about that situation, about the role you played? Yeah, because because that, what's the code name for her? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, Erica. Erica. Erica, yeah. So she almost wasn't selected, and and when I came on, we were in the selection process of with CPS. So I was a part of the selection and, and viewing of the, you know, observe, observing the kids while they're in kindergarten. And she was one who, the teachers and the the principal, they're all like, forget about it, don't even try. Like, yeah, she's she's she might seem like she has a bad attitude, but you haven't met her mom yet. Like, you do not want to deal with that. And I'm like, try me. Like, let's see, like, let me meet her. And like, she and her mom now, we're like, we, we realize we have, we're like the same Zodiac sign. Our birthdays are a few days apart. We, um, and we bonded and she, she's also like another really close um, family of mine. And, and when this, when something happened at the school with her daughter, you know, she, she goes hard for her kids. So she was up at the school and she was ready to um, fight the teacher. And um, and they already had a bad relationship with her because of her aggressiveness, but because I knew her well enough to say like, hey, don't, don't write her out. Like they were ready to kick the kid out the school, not because of anything the child did, but because they didn't want to deal with her mom and her grandma. And um, just from that situation alone, uh, we were able to, I was able to humanize her in a sense to the principal, to the staff. Like, yeah, I didn't condone her behavior and I didn't condone her language, but at the same time, she's, she's, a, she's a human, she's a parent, she's a mother. And maybe your methods may not have been the same as her methods, but if somebody did something to your child, I'm sure you would have a, re a reaction. And so just being able to kind of 
simmer everyone down and then get to the bottom of the, the issue, which was mainly between her two students. And, and that was getting lost in, in the drama of parent. And, and that's not what we want. We, <clears throat> we're here to advocate for these children. And any, any differences that staff and principal and parents have with one another, you know, we're the adults. So we need to act as such and bring ourselves to a level where we can reason for the kids. And they have to see that too, because they're going to they're gonna emulate what they see. So if they see their parents acting crazy and the teachers acting crazy, then they're going to think that's how you resolve issues. And that's not what we're trying to teach them, so. Thank you. So, to, so uh, we bring kids into our program in kindergarten. We stick with them for 12 and a half years, no matter what. There's nothing a child can do to be kicked out of our program. Um, our families tend to be very transient. There's a lot of housing instability. And so as long as they stay within a loose hours drive of Chicago, of, um, of the Austin area, we'll stick with the kids. So Melanie herself has had kids that have gone to Bolingbrook, to Aurora. Uh, have you had anyone go to the South Side? I can't remember. Yep. yep, to the South Side. So we follow them wherever they go through their transitions. Uh, Melanie has had a few girls that have already switched who are in second grade or third grade have already gone to three different schools. And so really the one constant in their life is Melanie. Um, our kids don't get kicked out of our program. Most programs will kick out kids or families that are really hard to deal with. Um, that is not our way. Our families are in our program because their lives are really hard. Um, kids can make dumb decisions because they're kids. They're supposed to make dumb decisions, right? They're um, there, and so they, that's just when they need us to just stick with them that much more. Um, we have had kids that have moved out of state. And in that case, then we can't, start, we can't get to them anymore. Um, but if those kids come back to the Chicago area, which may happen as well, then we bring them back into our program. Um, I do wanna honor our time because otherwise you guys won't come back next time I invite you for a half hour get together. Um, I'm gonna send you a follow-up email just to thank you. Um, and in it, I'm gonna include a picture of, um, the girl, I can't remember her code name right now, that uh, Melanie did the, the marble project uh, with, so you can just see her working on that. I'm gonna send you a video called Building Bridges of Trust that features the mom who fiercely wants to advocate for her daughter who did wanna fight the teacher, but you can just, in the video, you just see that this is just a really loving mom that wants the best for her kid. And then a letter of support, the principal from the school where this mom attends wrote about how important we are in in helping the schools connect with families that they can't develop a relationship with. Like it's just, it's so, it's such a broken, volatile relationship. They need us to come in to basically serve as a mediator and an advocate uh, for our kids. And if you ever want to Zoom or meet with me alone, I have so much more I want to share with you. Um, but in the meantime, I want to say cheers to you all. And I am so, so grateful that you spent this time with us today. Um, Jeannie is always uh, available to also answer on your questions, but Melanie, thank you for sharing your stories today. Um, oh, yeah, no problem. And thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. I think Meg just asked a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. I, I don't need the answer now. Okay. <laughs> I guess I, I was struck by the fact that in other conversations we've had, it, uh, a key part of choosing kids is that um, they don't have somebody to advocate the kid for them. So, but really you don't have to take other people's time. I'll give, I'll give a quick answer because I think that's a really good question. So I would, all of our kids live with an adult. All of our kids live with an adult who love them in their ways. Uh -huh. um, our parents, um, some of them show up to advocate for their kids, but not always in the most productive way. So what, um, in Erica's case, she had a mom advocating for her, but it was doing her a significant disservice. Um, the school hated mom and that was coming across onto Erica as well. Um, and we have other parents that are just, um, feel really despondent and hopeless and don't show up to advocate. And so, um, and again, it's not that they don't care about their kid. Like it's always a more complicated story of what's happening, but they aren't able to, I would say, successfully advocate for their okay. kid. Got it. Okay, now I promise it, I promise Thank you, everyone. 
I want to leave you wanting more, and I look forward to being in touch with you all. Take care. Bye. All right. Thank y'all. Thank you. That was great. Bye. 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 Do you want me to leave? No, I want you to stay. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to be here. I'm going to stop the recording. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs>